My name is Richard Charles. I'm 68 years old. Today's date, May 8th, 2008, in Sacramento, California. Hold it up. You go. Oh, I thought it was when we start. My name is Bobby Averett. I happen to be 95 years old. Today is May 8th, 2008. My location is Sacramento, California. My relationship to partner is a dear friend, Richard Charles. My name is Leslie Fink. I am 57 years old. Today's date is May 8th, 2008. We're in Sacramento, California, and I'm sitting with Richard Charles and Bobby Averett, who are both friends and residents at the Albert Einstein Center, of which I am the executive director. Richard Charles again. I was born in Fallon, Nevada, 1940, raised primarily in Dunsmore, California during the Second World War with my parents, Doris and Paul Charles. And during that period of time, my parents got a divorce and remarried around 1950, which I made me about 10 years old. I had a great upbringing. I had great examples set in my life by my grandfather, who was a conductor on the railroad, but so much more in life than that. He was a lobbyist for the American Association of Railroads. He was a big uh, representative of the United Transportation Workers in uh, Washington. He was... Uh, educated to the tune of the fourth grade. He had beautiful handwriting. He was had the greatest saying in the world that he taught all of his kids that anybody that hung around with him and it was do what you do so you can do what you want to do. And that's what we grew up with. And that was our work ethic. And if you followed that you never heard of discipline or anything else during our growing up years. And that applied to boys and girls, period. And that was the, that was the rule set in steel, yeah. And so we went to college, graduated out of high school, went to college. Uh, in the term of college, my partying days became very hectic and I became number one on the draft list. And so I had a friend that, uh, namely my mother, that called me and said, I was told that you are number one on the draft list. And so get right prepared for the Army. And I said, no, no, no. I'm going to get prepared for what I wanted to do. So I went and joined the U.S. Navy. Yeah. Dropped out of school. Went to the Navy. Spent six years. Had a lovely time. Ended up getting injured. Spent a few years re rehabbing, got out and uh, back to civilian life, went to work at the railroad, the Southern Pacific Company, spent a few years there, advanced through there, and then it was time to try something new. So a leave absence came into effect and I became part of the business world. And trucks came into it, uh, private business came in, and by the time it got all done with was a marriage happened, a marriage dissolved, kids born, kids grew up, kids uh, outgrew everybody and became their own partners in life and found their husbands, wives, so on, and their own responsibilities. And it leads us right up to today, and I've had a great life. Nothing wrong with it, and I'm thoroughly happy with everything, ex-wives and all. <laughs> And that's about it up to this present day. How about your kids? They're up. They're they're healthy, and they uh, have produced uh, their own kids. Great kids, yeah. And we maintain a good communication. And uh, as long as my health uh, deals, you'll probably never see them. Well, one thing that has always amazed me about you is was your loyalty toward your mom. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we had loyalty instilled in us right from, right from my grandparents, because uh, my grandfather 
on my mother's side was 98 and 5 months when he died. My fa- grandfather on my father's side was 98 and 5 months when he died. They were both born in the same year, not the same month. Yeah. And both grandmothers died at the age of 87. And but in previous time, all the way back in family history was that the younger people took care of the older people because that was the custom of the day, you know. And so by the time it got all done with, uh, my mother's uh, parents came from Texas. My great-grandfather was a division foreman for the old King Ranch at that time. And so his parents lived with my great-grandparents, and then my great-grandparents lived with my great-aunts, after my great grandfather died, you know, and so it was just on right on down the line, and so when my grandparents became very, uh, well, not frail because to look at my grandfather, you never knew he had a frail day in his life, but his eyesight started waning a little bit, so he came to live with my mother and myself down here in Sacramento, and the funniest part about it was that he was a walker, he would just take off and just walk for miles. When Dunsmuir, the town uh, in the next town is a place called Mount Shasta, which is nine miles away, he used to walk it. You know, he used to walk to Castle Craig's, which is six miles, approximately about six miles south of Dunsmuir to get sawdust for his garden. He would take gunny sets, go down and fill up the, uh, the sawdust and walk back, you know. He enjoyed it. No shot. And my other grandfather was exactly the same way. They did an excessive amount of walking. They did an excessive amount of uh, physical labor. Lived in 98 and 5 months. So it, what they say just might be the truth. Yeah. Keep active, in other words. So And you're, and you're active. And I'm active. i gotta got to do that. Yeah. So that's about all it is for me. Yeah. That's my total life right there. But it's just like everything else is. Keep doing what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. Is there a final story that you feel would summarize your life? Breathing. Yeah. (laughs) Because I've been shot at. I've been hit. I've been in massive car wrecks. I've survived. I've been in various situations that uh, you look up to the heavens and say, how did I start, end up here, you know? I've been, I've had some vastly embarrassing situations in my life and a lot of vastly rewarding situations in my life. And to say one was more than the other was uh, different. But the one I really liked was when I was in the service. I was in the jungle. And to say that miracles don't happen was that we were surrounded. And we, they were picking us off slow but sure, one way or another. And uh, all of a sudden, the Marines came in because we had called for reinforcement. And the Marines came to rescue us. And uh, it was in the grove of trees where the, the tree itself is elevated out of the ground and the roots are exposed. And covered with mud, hiding in the uh, darkness, so on, and uh, trying to stay alive. And anyway, the Marine came right up to me and said, come on, let's get out of here. And I said, how'd you find me? And he says, we heard you singing. And I said, I wasn't singing. He says, you were singing the old rugged cross. (laughs) And that's what led us right to you. And so that was a miracle in my book. So away we went. You know, and that's why I'm sitting here today is because of him here in the old rugged cross. In Vietnam? Yep. Mm. Yeah, in the jungle. So, but that was my greatest uh, greatest example of uh, everything. Life, you know, and uh, the most, most beautiful thing that ever happened to me, to tell you the truth, other than the married to two wonderful women and uh, the birth of my children, period, you know. And seeing them evolve to what they are today. Yeah. 
And so, but that's all I have to say. This is Leslie Fink, and I was born in Detroit, Michigan, 1951, and I have lived a very happy life. And I am the uh, number two child to Ruth and Maury Fink. My dad's name originally was Finkelstein. He was born in Poland, and my mom was born in Detroit. And I have an older brother, Howard, and a younger sister, Marcia. And we all grew up in uh, first Detroit, then uh, Oak Park, Michigan, then Southfield, Michigan. We lived the uh, good life in suburbia. And uh, I really had a wonderful childhood. And I was very, very fortunate to um, have my grandmother, Nana Rose Wispy, who lived with us when she wasn't taking care of newborn babies. So I had exposure to seniors or elderly or storytelling very early in my life and we all everybody adored my grandmother she was um, revered by many and she passed on some wonderful qualities not only to my mom Ruth but my own uh, self um, I, I've learned compassion and listening skills and uh, love of baking and cooking really through my grandmother and uh, from my dad, I, I've learned really the creative side of life. I, I've learned to be intuitive, a quest for knowledge and education, and uh, a, a real love for photography and arts. My dad was actually a photographer during the World War II. He was a reconnaissance photographer and has many pictures over Burma and the Himalayas. I, I grew up, again, as I said, in Michigan, and um, uh, I had a wonderful education, and ultimately, I went to uh, college, and I, I, I love psychology, and um, my um, interest in being a psychologist really was short-lived or, or short because um, I, I actually loved it. I worked at Sinai Hospital in the psychiatric unit. In fact, I was working at a, a wonderful program at Sinai Hospital, which was called the um, Problems of Daily Living Clinic. And this was really early on when people really needed treatment for everyday problems, from sexual dysfunction to alcoholism to anxiety attacks. I worked with a lot of wonderful people learning that. But ultimately, I, I couldn't get into any psychology grad schools because um, they were very difficult, even harder than medical school in those days. So I ended up getting a... Uh, opportunity to go to the George Washington University for graduate school and um, got a degree in mental health administration, which is actually a, a part of hospital administration. And I, it was a two-year program. The first year was in the school in Washington, D.C., which I love. What a fun town to live in. And then ultimately, uh, instead of going to Chicago to be with this, the world's number one administrator in mental health administration, he called me, his name was Mr. Pipenbrink. He called me and said, Les, if you want to go to New York City, I just got a job among 5,000 applicants to run Willowbrook. Willowbrook was an incredible snake pit on Staten Island. Willowbrook uh, became uh, very famous when this two-bit reporter named Geraldo Rivera exposed all the atrocities that were going on in this horrible institution. There was a staff-patient relationship of about 90 residents to one staff, and it was deplorable. By the time I got to Willowbrook, basically, um, Willowbrook had been taken over by the courts. Uh, they were originally, um, I believe, um, the time I got there, there were 6,000 people living there, but originally there were, I think, 20,000 people living in this institution. Ultimately, <laughs> I, I ended up getting uh, uh, an opportunity to move to New York City after Willowbrook, and I worked at St. Vincent's Hospital under a wonderful director named uh, Mr. DePiro, John DePiro, who loved me, and then I, I was hired on there at, at, in, at, on Staten <laughs> Island. Ultimately, I got a job in uh, San Diego, California, working at the uh, San Diego Hebrew Home, where I worked there for several years before the opportunity of the Albert Einstein Center, which was 
had their ground broken in 1980 and their doors opened in 1981, November 1981. I moved up to Sacramento in April of 1981 and I became their executive director. Uh, gratefully, under the uh, leadership of Judge Leonard Friedman, Leonard was just an incredible Renaissance <laughs> man. Leonard was uh, a brilliant man, uh, a leader, and uh, really took a liking to me, and I worked very closely with him, and I had a wonderful board of directors of a number, there were nine board of directors, and one of the people who was on the board was a lady named Lillian Dawson. Well, Lillian, she always said, I'm going to put my foot where my mouth is, and she ultimately moved into the Einstein Center, and she proved to be not only a, a great leader of the Jewish community in Sacramento, but representing the Einstein Center, she really uh, created some wonderful visions, and we worked very closely together, and she was a very, very dear friend. And um, um, I, I, over the years, have developed just wonderful relationships with board of directors, the Jewish community in Sacramento, and uh, tons of wonderful residents who have lived at the Einstein Center. Some that come to mind is, uh, first, we had a lady named Sonia Hornstein. Sonia comes from Detroit, and her family, they, she had five boys. They were called the Deans of the Deli. And these guys were just remarkable corned beef people. And some of them moved to Sacramento, where the mother, uh, Sonia, moved in. Well, she lived to be 101. And she had a, uh, a very big part of my life because when she, on her 100th birthday, I decided to create a video. Uh, and there wasn't even videotape cameras really in those days. They were just coming out. And I remember showing her uh, about a 15-minute story. And I remember sitting there with my uh, wife, Tina, and thinking, my God, this is just a roller coaster of emotion. 30 people were in the room. They were singing. They were dancing. They were crying as this story went on about Sonia. And I thought, God, this is an incredible idea. And fortunately, I was very lucky that uh, some people knew what I was interested in. They were very helpful in me procuring some wonderful video equipment that uh, really uh, sprung me into the world of storytelling and video making. Um, One of the stories that I did was another resident who lived at Einstein was Leon Reynas Lambe. He was the mayor of the Einstein Center, and he was a Holocaust survivor. And uh, I had a wonderful relationship with him and Nuta, and her, her, his two daughters, or their two daughters, uh, Mina and Nellie. And uh, God, they, they had told wonderful stories, and um, uh, he was a survivor, and, and he, he really died maybe uh, five years ago. Also, um, uh, one thing I, I didn't have a chance to say about Sonia is that one of the hardest things that I ever experienced at Einstein was uh, I had a very wonderful relationship with her, as, my, as I do with many of the residents, including Bobby, who's sitting next to me, where I would go in and they would uh, wine and dine me on their wonderful cuisine. And one day I went in and talked to Sonia, and I had a heart-to-heart -heart with her. I had just had my little girl, uh, Ashley Ray Fink. She was not even a year old, and, and Sonia was so possessive of her and, and really wouldn't let other seniors uh, get around her. She was very possessive, very demanding, and, and it was almost embarrassing. So I'll never forget having this long talk with Sonia, how much I adored her and loved her, but she had to lighten up. Other people want to share, share my love of my daughter and uh, back off a little. I, can't, I knew this was hard for her to hear. She's a very stubborn lady, although 101 years old at the time. She was a tough cookie. I came back a couple hours later just to make amends, and there she was lying dead on the floor. Oh, I'll never forget that. I just crushed her heart. That was pretty tough in those days. And and I've had just uh, both ups and downs over the years at the Einstein Center. Just wonderful relationships with people. 
another great relationship with people that uh, both Richard and Bobby will certainly know is Tommy, Tommy Mallory. I call him the uh, Jackie Robinson of the Einstein Center. He broke the color barrier, and he was just a wonderful human being. He gave so much, but uh, he took a lot. He wanted a lot. He was certainly somebody you had to nurture, but he was really uh, quite a guy. Um, uh, I, I didn't get to say much about my daughter, Ashley. She's really the apple of my eye. And I, I was married for almost 18 years, and we had a relationship that was uh, pretty consistent. And um, unfortunately, we sort of drifted apart. And uh, still, my ex-wife, Tina, is, is, is very devoted to Ashley as well as myself. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Ashley tonight, who's uh, coming in from college. She's going to school at the Academy of Art. Um, one of my favorite stories that I'd like to share that sort of typifies my relationship with some of the residents at Einstein is with a young man named Herb Chase. One day Herb came to me and said, Les, I have some shoes I want to give you. And I said, God, that would be great. I'd love your shoes. Well, he brings me down a box of, uh, or a, sh a shoe box with brand new shoes in it from Nordstrom's. I said, my God, what are you giving those to me for? They're $85 shoes. Why don't you just take them back? Well, Herb does not like to deal with issues. So I said, look, Herb, thanks. I, I will relish the, ch the shoes and look forward to wearing them. Well, I ran down to Nordstrom's, returned them, which is no problem whatsoever, and I got the $85 plus tax, and I put it in a birthday card to him, and I stuck it under his door, and I thought, he will really be a happy camper. Well, he never said anything to me, and several days later, uh, I had hired some painters to paint my house on the inside, and I couldn't get into the garage, which 99.9% .9 of the times I enter my home through the garage, and I decided I had to go through the front door. I go to the front door. There at the front door is a huge styrofoam box Leslie Fink from Omaha Steaks. I open it up, and sure enough, Herb ordered these beautiful Omaha Steaks for me in appreciation of our friendship, which uh, is just, um, uh, uh, I really relish. Um, well, all in all, I, I think one of the secrets to life is, is giving. And I, I swear, if you're a good person, you know, people give back to you. And, and um, it's really wonderful being able to work at the Einstein Center because uh, people, for the most part, really reciprocate. They are appreciative, as Bobby is. Uh, almost every day I can go up there and uh, catch a glimpse of uh, Dr. Phil or Oprah, a little fresh applesauce or mandel bread. She is so kind and giving, and, and same with Richard. Richard has no, uh, um, uh, what's the right word? He has, a, a, an, he has a desire to constantly give back. He, there's never a time where he says no. Uh, he's, a, he's the right arm of Kelly. He has been so helpful to the operation at Einstein, and really since Richard has come to Einstein, uh, the place has blossomed, and, and we owe uh, Richard a lot of gratitude. Um, I have been very fortunate in my life. I have very good health. I'm very happy. But there is one repeating thing that I have had, and that is uh, a couple times I have been madly in love, and, and both times these relationships were destroyed by the girls' families. Uh, the first time was my first love was in high school, it was uh, really a, a great love. The parents loved me. They used to take me on vacation with them. And then we went off to college, and um, uh, it, we sort of drifted apart. But when summertime came, the family really encouraged us to get back together. And we really had this incredible, torrid romance. And unfortunately, the mother realized that we must have been sleeping together. Well, my God, all hell broke out because... Uh, she literally uh, ended up hiring someone to kill me. And I'll never forget my grandmother, Nana, listening on the other line where some guy, some black man, was literally saying he was going to kill me. And I'll never forget coming downstairs, and she had turned white as a sheet. 
and uh, ultimately that relationship ended. And uh, most recently, only a few years ago, I was very involved with my uh, best friend's uh, 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 sister-in-law. Well, who goes out with someone's sister-in-law? This was crazy. He thought it was just totally inappropriate. And, and unfortunately, that relationship came to an end after two years. Um, contrary to what he may think, he was madly in love with her himself and lusted after her and uh, couldn't handle me going out with her. And ultimately, uh, that relationship ended. Right now, I'm involved with uh, Lynn Knoll, who is just a wonderful person, and I just have the best of times with her and really enjoy her companionship, her love, and we've had wonderful times together. All in all, I'm um, a happy camper. I've had a, a great life, and I'm looking forward to many more years of golf, good health, and happiness. And uh, I, I, I would want to say that I am very, very um, fortunate that I have my parents still living. My mom and dad are both incredibly generous, incredibly supportive, and over the years I have had a chance to get closer and closer with them. We talk almost every day and uh, share the life and times of each of us. They're still in Detroit, and I'm looking forward to them coming out in June for some golf and good food and conversation. And um, also, I think I'm uh, very fortunate to be uh, Jewish. Although I'm not practicing Judaism uh, on an everyday basis, the core values of the religion have taught me about generosity, uh, respecting my elders, respecting others, and uh, you know, give, uh, what is it, do unto others as you wish to be done to yourself. I'm very proud of the employees that we have at the Einstein Center. Um, I've become very close with Yair and his family, and uh, I'm, we're very fortunate to have Kelly as our activities director and a wonderful kitchen staff. We have a, a couple girls in the kitchen, Maria and Deborah and Nina, uh, and just wonderful waitress staff. Um, let me just close on this one note, because I, I, was, I just left a board meeting. We had uh, a very devoted Jewish community, and through the Einstein Center, uh, much has happened in the Jewish community as a result of us. And we recently had an incident where the Jewish Federation was basically selling our parking lot, which we bought, and the rest of the land, which we bought, back to us. And the amount of greed that I saw coming from that organization was just shocking and unfortunate, but fortunately, our board of directors, with all the different skills that are on our board and devotion, I was so proud of how that group rallied behind uh, my leadership. Um, we have just a campaign, a PR campaign, letter writing, analyzing documents, and uh, fortunately, uh, when I asked the board that if we don't get this land, we will never have a future, uh, they took heed and really uh, acted upon it. So I'm very, very grateful to be working with such a devoted board and devoted residents. We have a great group there, and I um, am very grateful to StoryCorps for this opportunity to share those thoughts and we, in the near future at Einstein, are going to be kicking off a similar book and video program that sort of emulates what StoryCorps started in Grand Central Station. Thank you. Where do I start? You grew up in uh, the Catskills. I, yeah. I was born October 2nd, 1912 in Monticello, New York. They didn't have a hospital there, so I was born at home, where at that time they didn't have baby scales, so they must have hooked me on a chicken scale and found that I weighed 14 pounds. The doctor took one look at me and told my mother to dress me and send me to school. I my family had a small hotel in the country called Cooper's Corner, 
and that's where I spent most of my youth, and it was always the happy time of my life. I was never one for being very active to help the family at the hotel. I spent more time being out on the road to see how many rides I can get into town when it reached the point where the guests would sit on the lawn and take bets as to how long it would take for me to get a ride going back and forth. And that was something I enjoyed very much. As I grew older, I made friends with all the residents. And one of the residents decided he had a friend who had a car and he would ask him to drive up to the country so they, they could spend a weekend there. And his to get him to drive up, he told him that he would introduce him to the farmer's daughter, which happened to be me. And as it happened, this fellow did come up and I decided I liked the ring he was wearing, and I asked him to give me the ring. He did, and that meant when he got home, I still had the ring, so there was a reason for him to come back the next weekend to get his ring. Well, that went on for a year and a half, and then I wound up marrying him. We were married for 23 years, living in New York City for the winter, and then in my youth, it was always a case where I had to come back in the country to help run the hotel. Uh, living in the country in the winter was very, very difficult, so that's when every winter we, it meant going back to New York to get away from the cold weather, which, which in turn made it very hard in my, in my youth to go through my schooling because it was a case where I never started any of my classes at the beginning of the class. I would have to start the middle, so I, as I say, never started at the beginning because when it came time to go back to the country to get ready for the hotel, I would have to leave the city school and start in the little red schoolhouse in the country. I look back at those years and realize it was so wonderful living in the country even though when i was when i was born living in the country wasn't easy because no electricity no no to no how to go and use an outside toilet but it was something we had to accept and make the best of it as i after i got married in, uh, I think I was married seven years when my husband had to go into the service. And at that time, it meant that I would have to go to work. So I found in New York, they were advertising for someone to learn key punch operating and being paid while you were learning. So I took advantage of that and did become a key punch operator. When he got out of the service, I left that job and then we decided we wanted to build a house in the country. And in dribs and drabs, I continued to work and put the money aside so we would build the house. So the first year, it was the foundation. The second year, it was having the well, the water, the well drilled. And in time, each year, that went on. And in 1951, we were able to move into the, our home. And at that time, they, my, my sister-in-law saw an ad in the paper for Fallsburg needing a man to work in a candy business. And that's exactly what the work that my husband knew. So he went to apply, and he did. So we had to go back to New York. He, I had to give notice to my job that I was leaving, and he, in turn, did the same for him. So we moved into our home in 1951 and the six years that we lived there of course the first thing we did was get a dog which we were crazy about since we didn't have children that dog was like a child to us and in 1957 I get a letter from my family in California that a brother-in-law had passed away and if we would sell our home and make the move to California, my husband would be able to take over that brother-in-law's business. 
Well, I was dead set against it because that home meant so much to me. Every nail in that house was was something that I felt we worked so hard for it, I never wanted to leave. But my husband convinced me and said, if we didn't make the move for the rest of his life, he would be working for somebody else. Whereas if we go to California, I was that he'd be able to take over the brother-in-law's business, which we did. We arrived in California in 1957 and were very fortunate in getting an apartment right next door to the apartment that my sister and her husband had. So it was so easy for him to take over that business, which we did. Uh, the business was a sundry business, which meant just very incidental things that he was selling to drugstores. I, in turn, helped him run the business, even made some deliveries. And the business went so well that evidently, for the first time in his life, he was walking around with wads of money in his pocket, and too bad that that went to his head. And Tell him a little about your life at the Red Cross. Well, the, well, that's when, after the divorce, no, you're, I'm jumping ahead, uh, my husband uh, started to do see women on the side, which he denied. When I would talk to him about it, he would say, I'm going through the changes and it's all in my head. So when I found the evidence that I needed, I didn't even say anything to him and decided I would divorce him. And after I divorced him, I was finding it very hard to, to settle and think about making another life for myself. Fortunately, I took up a course of, P of PBX work, and then I couldn't think of going out to find a job after having five days of that work. I still felt like I knew nothing about it. But my sister was smart enough to tell me we lived across the street from Red Cross on Vermont Avenue, that I could go and qualify, ask to volunteer work there, and I would be able to get the, the full experience of working there so I would feel better about getting a job. I walked across to Red Cross and spoke to the controller, and the first question he asked me is, what work have you ever done? I said, well, in New York, I was a key punch operator. And when he heard that, his eyes opened up. He said they had an ad in the paper for a number of weeks and didn't get one response for a key punch operator. Was I interested in employment? I said, definitely. He said, you want to start today? And I said, no, but I'll be happy to start tomorrow. And he, when he mentioned how little money he was being a, they were paying for that job, he didn't realize that if he said it was half the amount, I would have accepted it anyway, because at that point, I felt as though my life was coming to an end. I was past the age limit, and I was sure I would never find another job. So I did start to work, and I worked there for 15 years when I decided I saw too many people work there until they were 65 before they would retire. And so many of them, after they retired, within a year or two, they died, were sick, and died. And I decided, since I only had to cross one street and go home for lunch, I would be able to manage if I took early retirement. And at that point, I was given the option, do you want to take your retirement money out or leave it there until you're 65, which meant leaving it there for three years. And I was so smart and thought about it and decided I would do that. I would not take my money out until I'm 65. That was the best move I ever made because they didn't want to let me go at 62, so they had me come in as part-time to work there until I reached 65. And when I told them that this chance came up about going to the, having my own home in the country, they decided they were going to let me go. And I got the most beautiful letter from them and made the move, leaving Los Angeles, 
No, I stayed in Los Angeles. I lived in that one apartment for 40 years, and I never thought I would leave there. And uh, after living there that many years, I, I would tell my niece who lived in Sacramento, who wanted me to come to Sacramento, that I would stay there probably until I died. But I don't know, something happened, and she talked me into coming to Sacramento. And we're happy you did that, Bobby. That was the best move I ever made because I'm 95 years old and I am so happy with my life now. And it's mainly because of this Mr. Les Fink who has been so wonderful to me. When I was sick, that man didn't think I was going to make it home, but I fooled him. He didn't think I'd come back to Einstein. But I'm here, and every day I am so grateful and thank God for each day that I'm here because it's the best place in Los Angeles, in Sacramento. There isn't a better place as far as I'm concerned. I love everybody there, and I'm very, very happy to be alive at 95 and blessed each day that I'm alive.